Hi, uh, welcome here today. Uh, um, my name is John Schedule. I'm a UI designer here at Google, and I'm uh, going to welcome Ed Rowe and Rob Christensen from Adobe. Uh, they're going to be speaking on Adobe Air, and uh, it's a great uh, technology, and I hope that you guys get a lot out of it. Thanks, John. I'm Rob Christensen. Uh, this is Ed. Hi, I'm Ed. <laughs> um, we understand that there's, a, that there's a celebrity chef here today at Google, and we really appreciate everyone who decided to choose us over the celebrity chef. So thanks for coming. Appreciate it. You said there's a celebrity chef here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stay here. Please don't go. <laughs> so um, uh, we'd like to keep this pretty informal. So if you have questions um, at any time, just feel free to, to fire them out, and uh, we'll repeat the questions and, and answer them. Uh, I'm, a, I'm one of the product managers on Air, and uh, Ed runs engineering, as John had said. So. What is Air? How many people here have heard about Air today? Or, okay, so that's good. How many people have built on it? Okay, that's pretty good. So the, the way that we define Adobe Air is that it's a cross-operating system runtime that allows developers to leverage their existing skills with web technologies like Flash, HTML, Ajax, JavaScript, uh, to build rich internet applications for the desktop. So what exactly does that mean? Well. What we're saying is that there, one, one thing that, we, that was really kind of an impetus for this project is that uh, we noticed an incredible amount of innovation happening on the internet for the last 15 years, and the user experience is getting better and better, so much to the point that it seemed like desktops weren't really keeping up. So um, we were pretty, pretty excited about allowing web developers to take a lot of their existing code and use their existing tools to build desktop applications. Uh, and our design is, our intention is really um, to complement existing websites. We're not necessarily suggesting that uh, Air is designed to, to displace websites or anything like that. This is really designed to extend the user experience outside of the web, uh, a website to, uh, to the desktop. So we'll be showing <clears throat> some examples a little bit later on. In fact, most of our presentation will be showing what some of the early adopters of Air have been building, including some of our partners and just uh, interesting uh, developers like yourselves who, who are just out there um, wanting to push the limits. So uh, with that said, I'm going to transition this over to Ed. He's going to talk a little bit about just kind of the architecture um, pretty briefly, and then we're going to move on to uh, talking again about some demos. Thanks. Right. So as Rob said, this is a sort of a simple picture of the technology stack. Important thing to know about Air is, as like uh, Rob said, it's totally independent of the web browser. So it runs external to the browser. Uh, as a desktop runtime. But Air itself is really behind the scenes. So if it, you know, the star of the show is an application, not the runtime. So the, the applications sit on top of the runtime. The runtime is just behind the scenes you know, taking care of business. Just like in the browser, you know, the user is not thinking about an HTML engine or a Flash engine or, or a real player engine or any of these other things. They're just thinking about the content and the experience that they're getting. So we're, with Air, we're trying to extend you know, the developer's ability to bring those experiences to the desktop but not actually to put any of our own Chrome or any of our, our own experience on top of it. So just in brief, um, the operating system is on the bottom of this stack. We're uh, going to ship Air 1.0 early next year, uh, both on Mac and on Windows. We're also currently working on a Linux version, and that will come a bit later. So you know, our goal to bring it across operating systems. Runtime sits on top of that, provides a bunch of functionality and APIs to the applications that sit on top of that. The applications can be built primarily in Flash-based technologies. So that might use uh, Adobe's Flex uh, and ActionScript languages or the Flash authoring product. Or they can build, be built using HTML and JavaScript technologies and all your standard AJAX frameworks and so forth. Uh, you can pick either of these things. You can write a pure HTML and JavaScript app if you want. You can write a Flash or Flex-based application. Or you can mix, mix, mix them and match them. So you can take an HTML application and use Flash in it, just like you see in the browser today. Or you could take a you know, primarily Flex-based application and use HTML in it very seamlessly. And we've merged these very seamlessly together, both in the imaging model and in the scripting model. And I think we'll have some examples of both of these cases uh, in our demos. You can also make use of PDF documents within these Air applications, similar to what you can do in the web browser, where you can display a PDF document in there. A brief tour of, of some of the capabilities, and then Rob's going to show a bunch of them to you. 
uh, because Air is fundamentally based on web technologies, including the Flash Player, there's very rich support for multimedia. So your typical vector animations, uh, uh, H.264 video as well as H.263. Uh, you have full screen hardware accelerated video. So it's, it's a great engine for media playback for both an audio and video standpoint. We've added the ability for these applications to access the local disk. So these are outside the browser. They're desktop applications. They can read and write the local file system. They also have an embedded SQL Lite database to work with. So you can uh, you know, use SQL to store your information locally. The applications are multi-window applications, as you would expect. So that same application, multiple windows. And um, briefly, the HTML engine, we, what we're using is the WebKit engine, which is inside Safari and is also the engine that you guys are now using in Android. Uh, open source engine based on KHTML in the beginning, and that is the engine that's inside Air. So you have you know, the same sort of HTML capabilities that you'd expect to have in a modern web environment. Just like any desktop application, you need to have access to desktop services. So th these applications can integrate with drag and drop. So you drag and drop between app other applications like, say, Excel or the desktop. You have access to the local clipboard. We've also added some other integration capabilities that aren't quite as common, where um, we've put in the capability to detect network transitions. So if I yank the network cable, the application can get an event and adapt to that. Or if I put the cable back in, same sort of thing. It can also integrate with the system's notification mechanisms. So on Microsoft Windows, down on the lower right, you've got the system tray, and you can see icons down there and pop-ups and so forth. The applications can work with that. They can also uh, do things like on Mac, bounce the dock. Um, are we showing uh, any of the install sequence? Uh, we can. We can. We, um, the app, so the applications get installed via an install sequence, generally that's triggered by the browser. So you're at some website, it says, hey, do you want to get a desktop app of this? You click on it, you go through some screens that say, hey, security, this and that, and then the application winds up being installed. Our job to take care of that, the developer doesn't have to worry about it. So, so like everything else in Air, cross-platform sort of comes first. So you write the app once, it's based on HTML or Flash or whatever, you package it up in essentially a zip file, and then the runtime itself takes care of getting that deployed onto an operating system and integrated in the ways that the operating systems want for an app. So on Windows, it gets into the control panel, for example, so you can uninstall it from there. So at the end of the day, you have something that feels like a regular desktop app, even though it's completely cross-platform and built with web technology. So um, these are built with web technologies and use, use the same tools that you use with web technologies. So um, Adobe has a variety of these tools, but by no means is anybody restricted to those. So Adobe has Flex, the Flash authoring product, and Dreamweaver, which target respectively Flash, slash Flex, Flash, and HTML. Uh, there's also great support in a uh, third-party IDE that's called Aptana, which is a, a really cool Ajax IDE that has um, built-in air support at this point. We're also uh, giving out a free SDK with command line tools, so it can be integrated into build environments or into any other environment that you want to use. So if someone wants to use VI or Notepad or Emacs or whatever it might be, it's completely possible to write air applications just using that tool chain. This is a quick picture of some of the authoring support that we've built into our tools. Um, Flex Builder 3, which will also be shipping early next year, has some great support for uh, integrated debugging, source level debugging with breakpoints and everything. Um, we've just added a very cool feature, which is a profiler, letting you uh, both check out CPU and memory usage with pretty advanced memory dumping capabilities, seeing what your object, where your objects are going. Uh, turns out once you start building real apps, you start really needing to worry about that. Um, we've also extended both Dreamweaver and Flash CS3 to have built-in support for air um, debugging in the case of Flash authoring and code hinting and uh, creating the applications. And all of this can be downloaded from labs.adobe.com in preview versions. With that, I will turn it back to you, Rob. Just, just wanted to ask if there are any questions at this point. We're kind of moving pretty quickly. Uh, yep. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Actually, if you bring the mic. So uh, my question was kind of about the uh, model. 
you guys are using to build applications? I mean, I think it's interesting that you have, uh, so for example, you're talking about profiling in the tool support. Um, but I guess the model is pretty much that you have a web server or at the back end doing most of the computational heavy lifting for whatever the application is. And sort of Air is providing a front end. Um, what if I wanted to, say, kind of use Air as a replacement for a traditional desktop GUI, but for a desktop application? So um, you certainly could have a server use, you know, do most of the heavy lifting on the back end with the server, but that's, that's not our assumption. I mean, on the client, you have both the JavaScript engine and the um, Tamarin virtual machine that uh, Adobe recently open sourced to Mozilla, which is a jitted uh, scripting engine, so it's substantially faster than your typical JavaScript engine. So you can sort of choose how you want to put the computation load, whether it be all on the client, all on the server, or what we see most apps, which is doing a combination of both. I think we had another question up front. Yeah, um, uh, I just wanted to know how it integrates with like native code. Like if you if you wanted to write a component that used OpenGL or something and incorporate it into it using the using the rest of the GUI using Air. So there is not any capability for loading native DLLs, if that's what you're asking about. What would you imagine doing with that? Uh, probably I don't know, doing some computation locally or something that was intensive that couldn't be done in a scripting language fast enough. So your concern would be about performance? Yeah, it'd be performance or maybe some native APIs that I needed access that didn't have access to. OK. Yeah, not, not doing that right now. Okay. We create it essentially. Oh, so, yeah, yeah the, the question here is, is about uh, native code and our, our support for that. And uh, at least for now, Air, Air 1.0 is very much focused on being cross platform. That's our goal uh, for now. And, and uh, the future is uncertain. Um, we're certainly interested in hearing your feedback, uh, incorporating it into uh, our future uh, product. But for the moment, we want to make sure that the developer that builds an Air application targeting. Uh, Windows and Mac for version one. When the Linux version becomes available, it just works. Um, that's that's what we're after with Air right now. So, just from a high level, what are the main advantages of building an Air app versus just a pure web app? Since I'm writing most of it in all these things that work on the web. Well, a lot of the uh, system capabilities that Ed spoke to are not available in a web browser. For one, um, we'll show quite a few demos. For uh, in fact. That's kind of what we're, we're moving into. So I might suggest that we come back to that particular question. And hopefully, you'll see, based on some of the capabilities that uh, some of our, our, our customers are taking advantage of right now, how they're using it. But um, a lot of it has to do with, with branding, being able to really control uh, pixel perfect precision over, over uh, the design and interaction models. Um, some of that is available, obviously, in the browser. But there are certain things that you can do in, in an operating system level outside of the browser that are also quite interesting, being able to display system notifications. Um, things of, of that sort. What, uh, what, like, if you had the, like, the top five list of those things, what, what are they? System notifications? Uh, geez, top five list? I mean, uh, I, it's hard for me. I mean, I, that list that, that uh, Ed had presented, those two slides, I mean, all of those are compelling for different types of applications. It really depends on what you're building. There are some applications that you'll see in a moment where nobody has uh, taken advantage of certain APIs, whereas other ones, if you're building a very rich visually interesting application, then probably the H.264 video and the AAC uh, uh, audio are going to be very compelling to you. So just out of curiosity, what, what, do, you, what do you do here at Google? Um, maybe we can. I work on our APIs. <laughs> APIs, OK. So uh, well, we have a, a great example, I think, of uh, eBay's application. They have an application they've built called eBay Desktop that takes advantage of all of their APIs. And we'll show that in a minute. So uh, OK, so with that said, I'm um, going to switch over and just kind of, uh, Air has been out now in the public view um, beginning earlier this year. And uh, in October 1st, we had our first beta. And so, uh, I'm sorry, our second beta. We've had three public releases so far. Uh, and that's attracted quite a bit of interest. And so some of the customers that we're working with right now, pretty closely with to, to build out, um, they're building Air applications include the ones that you see here on this list. We'll show a few samples of some of these. Many of these are available to download on the internet right now, too, and, um, which is pretty exciting uh, in that we haven't quite hit 1.0 yet, and yet uh, people are already releasing software. 
And uh, in fact, uh, the first uh, application that I'm going to show you, I'm curious, uh, have people seen the uh, Google, Google Analytics demo? Looks like some people have. So I'll, I'll touch on that very briefly just to kind of touch on it for those people that haven't seen it. So uh, basically, I, I haven't shown the installation sequence here, but this installs very much like a native desktop application. You launch it um, on Windows. You launch it from the Start menu. Uh, and on the Mac, you would find it in the Applications folder or wherever the developer specified they wanted to, uh, to, specif uh, to, to provide it. Uh, this particular application was built not, not by Google, but a, a third-party developer who was very interested in providing a sort of different experience for looking at the analytics functionality. Um, that, that uh, Google provides. Some of the things that are kind of interesting about it are uh, its ability to uh, interact with other uh, data types. So you can basically export reports out to PDF and, and Excel files. Uh, this application is designed to run offline, so you don't have to be, maybe you're, you're on the plane and you want to do a quick check and see how your Google Analytics is doing. Uh, you, can, you can do that quite easily. Let me kind of tilt this over here. Uh, so, for example, here, let me go ahead and show an example of uh, the different views. This app was built in Flex. It's taking advantage of some of the comp charting components available in Flex, but they've been skinned and customized a bit. So, for example, this is kind of a, 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 a nice pr uh, view here as well. Let's see. Oh, looks like the map's not coming out. Oh, I clicked. I think my network connection might be a little going to let off of it. But anyways, you can still see here in a second that it integrates with uh, the Google mapping APIs to display the locations of, of visitors, which is pretty nice. And you can zoom in as you might expect with the uh, you know Google Google Maps. I'm going to uh, take this this um, app here and. Oh, sorry, there we go. So up here at the top, you can see, for example, I can click on a PDF button, and I click on it. Um, it'll basically generate a view of that particular report. When I double click on it, it'll launch in, in Acrobat, and I'll go full screen here. And you can see that very quickly, um, again, it's, it's very responsive. It's taking advantage of some ActionScript libraries available for doing PDF generation. Um, and you can see I have a nice clean report, so maybe I wanted to hand this off or forward it to a colleague. So I'm going to switch over to the, the Mac and show a few more demos here. Any questions about this particular application? No? So the, uh, the next app I'm going to show is, oop, let me plug in. Something uh, while Rob's plugging in that you'll notice, now that we're on the Mac, he's just launching these apps out of the dock. You know, they're just, there isn't some special launcher or shell or anything like that. To the user, they're just regular old apps. So yeah, Air, Air applications can be designed to run offline. This particular app, actually, um, they require that you're online to watch these videos. This is an application built by AOL. Um, AOL has an enormous uh, collection of artists that they work with through their Time Warner label. And one thing that they're experimenting with is how can they share a lot of the content that they're producing with, uh, uh, with those that are interested in, in artists. So uh, right, what you see here is a listing of a, the top 100 artists that they, they want to showcase for this particular, particular time. This app, uh, a couple things to kind of notice about it is it's been heavily customized. If you look at just, even though it's running on the Mac, it doesn't quite look like a Mac window. And it wouldn't look like that. Uh, it would look exactly the same on, on a, a window, Windows machine as well. You can see there's a slight drop shadow effect. It's very subtle. But the designer wanted to have a drop shadow, so that was very easy for them to do. Um, the uh, minimize button, the close button have all been customized. And they're basically just accessing air windowing APIs to be able to uh, modify the application state. 
So as for an example here, I've already added a few that are sort of some of my favorites. I'll click on one here. This is a Maroon 5. A couple of things that are kind of interesting here. One of them is that, as Ed had said, uh, Air support supports full screen video. This particular video is not uh, taking advantage of the new Beta 3 features, which, which are, isn't out yet, but will support H.264 in our next public release. Um, so, but it, it, what's nice about it is that you can still see that there's an interface here. I can decide if I want to, to maybe hide the interface, focus on the video, turn up the audio a little. I can move the mouse back over, the UI slides back out. Everything was up to the designer for how they wanted to, to create this experience. That's a good point. If, if you haven't made use of the um, Flash APIs that much, uh, video is essentially a first-class citizen, so it's not like it's stuffed to the front of the monitor like you often see in video frameworks. It's you know completely integrated into the imaging model, so having those controls on top of it or partially alpha to it, it's, it's simple. It's just you know standard drawing stack stuff. It's not any sort of portable compositing that you have to do specially. You could easily imagine AOL, who you know, they provide APIs for their instant messenger, integrating some of those capabilities and maybe building a version of this application that has additional collaborative capabilities. Um, I hit escape, I bounce back out. They added another interesting feature, which is basically sliding this over as kind of a, a widget on the left side. So maybe I want to go about my work and you know actually browse the web or, or do whatever. Um, that's, you know, we think about it as basically taking Flash and Flex and HTML to the desktop. We'll show some example applications as well of apps built using HTML and JavaScript. So the next application, uh, we mentioned eBay desktop. Um, eBay has, I don't know, thousands of APIs that they've introduced for their developers, and they're actually taking advantage of their own APIs to create a rich internet application for the desktop. Uh, and again, uh, eBay cares a lot about their brand, so you'll notice that the whole color scheme, the way that the window, the edges of the window, uh, it seems like the eBay logo kind of is just front and center and pops out a little bit. It's all been, been customized by um, their designers. So I can go in here, and I, as you might expect, I could search for an item. I have existing items that I have already uh, been watching. So for example, I missed out on the Porsche, but it looks like this uh, interesting Tesla coil thing <laughs> that I found last night by accident. I was actually looking for a Tesla uh, vehicle, but uh, I wound up with this thing instead. But you can see here that I've zoomed in now, and I'm, I'm looking at this particular item. Um, it's very interactive, so I'm sliding through and looking at the images. Um, I can go and I can get additional information on the seller. So again, it's just calling out to all those APIs that, that uh, eBay makes available. I can find out more information, whether or not I trust this person. It's a slightly more interesting experience than the browser. It works offline as well, which is, which is also uh, quite interesting. This particular app right now, oh, go ahead. Are you going to show the HTML if you scroll down? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. You want to speak to that? So some, something interesting to point out here is this application is making use of both flex, flesh Flash. Flex and Flash and HTML. Everything. This actually, the most of this application is written in Flex. Um, stop for a sec, Rob. Yep. Can you scroll back up? In fact, this whole panel we're seeing here is Flex. This sort of structured view of the data from the site and the photo riffler. But if, if you could scroll it down a little bit, Rob. Yep. Right here starts HTML, and unfortunately, in this case, it's not very interesting HTML. Apparently, coilers do not need uh, too many images. But um, yeah, there you go. So this is, H, this is the HTML from eBay, this sort of unstructured HTML that is with this item listing. And you, you can't tell the dividing line if I don't tell you, because you know, essentially the HTML region is just here. Again, just like video is really a first class citizen in the Flash display model, when you've got HTML in Flash, the HTML becomes a first class citizen in the display model. So it can be composited with the Flash content and scrolled and everything else. So uh, this is currently available um, on eBay's website, which is pretty exciting for us because uh, obviously we want people building and um, they're pushing the limits right now. Yeah, it's actually real live data. We have accidentally bought stuff before dur during demos and odd things have showed up at Adobe. 
So Rob, don't bid on the car. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's additional I don't things. Think you that, can expense that one. <laughs> it's a little too expensive, uh, fifty thousand. Um, you can add annotations. There's a lot of additional things that you might want to do in a desktop environment that maybe you wouldn't think in, to do in a, on a web page. Those, uh, those notes are stored locally so that I can access them offline. Um, so we'll keep moving here. One other thing to point about, out about the eBay application as well, it's, it's not in this version. They certainly intend to have uh, it have notifications where on the Mac it might bounce the dock icon and give you a a growly sort of notification, you know, you just got outbid or something, and a Windows have something in the system tray that pops up and says, hey, you know, you just won an auction, that sort of thing. So they're, they're interested in sort of doing some stuff like that that you would not see in a browser application. So another application is called Fine-Tune Desktop, and Fine-Tune is a website. It's kind of a social... <laughs> Uh, social website where you can basically define the types of music that you're interested in, and then the site makes recommendations based on the artists that you've already indicated that you like. Um, the, the, this, uh, this application was already originally built using Flash, or it may have been Flex, actually. I don't, I'm not positive, but it, we'll say Flash. And uh, what's interesting about it is that it shows integration with an online service. So I'm actually logged in right now. When I first launched this app, I had to do a login. It went out and and authenticated and then took advantage of uh, the local encrypted store in Air, which is a way of preserving, uh, protecting uh, login credentials, for example. So now that I'm logged in, it's already extracted uh, information about my music interests. Um, it's also inspected my iTunes library, so something unique. Again, desktop can't really do in a browser, but, uh, and it'll make suggestions based on the artists that I already have. So I'll select uh, an artist here. I hit play. One of the motivators for fine tune was that even though this player was available inside of a web page, uh, it's not always, people don't always want to have an extra web browser open. They don't think of that necessarily as a media player. Wouldn't it be nice just to have this other app that kind of sits around and I can launch it? Um, because it really is more of a music player than necessarily a, a website. So let's see if I got music here. So you can hear music comes on. Maybe I decide I don't, I don't like this particular song. Oop. Try to go forward, maybe connection issues. So here's another artist. Maybe I decide I like that. You can see one thing we didn't really talk about much is just really the performance. These are these are very fast applications. Um, I can launch multiple at the same time, and uh, they'll feel very native. Something that Rob just touched on briefly, which is worth drilling into a little bit, is that. You know, because it's using HTML, it's using Flash, it's using Flex, the kind of stuff that you're running in a web page. And in fact, these guys had a web version of something that looks almost exactly like this well before they had an Air version. It was way easier for them to get the desktop version working than if they had said, OK, I want a desktop version. Now i got to go learn C++ or .NET or something like that. They said, oh, OK, I can stick with my existing tools. I guarantee that that visualization up the top of the uh, the flipping album covers was not something they rewrote. They already had it on the site, and they said, OK, cool, we can reuse it in the desktop app. So it becomes really easy to reuse your UI elements between a desktop app and a browser-based app. It's quite likely that 95% of the code they used to build this app is just the same code they're using on their website. And they're just the extra code is to take advantage of the Air APIs and add additional capabilities for the desktop, like searching iTunes, for instance. So. Uh, Another example of an application, this particular app was built with a, uh, a uh, AJAX framework called XJS. Um, it's basically an RSS reader. It's called Fresh. What you'll notice about it is it, it feels pretty rich. It, it, uh, the skinning of the app, it feels like a native desktop application uh, to some degree. Um, you can add feeds. You can work offline. It writes out to the SQLite database uh, to go offline. It has preview, so I'm basically taking advantage of our, our web browser capabilities here, so I can say view and tab. It's rendering the actual web page here if I wanted to see uh, the real site, not necessarily the feed. Yeah, I think the, the key point of this application is that it is a pure HTML JavaScript application. Um, we've shown you some Flash and Flex apps. We've shown you some integrated apps. This app has no Flash or Flex at all. It's, it's pure HTML JavaScript. It's using, as Rob said, the XJS AJAX framework. And if we 
cracked it open and showed it to you, you'd see you know, HTML files and JS files and pings and that sort of thing make up the entirety of the application. Okay. So an another application, this one's available for download. This was built by an Adobe employee uh, and designed by another Adobe employee, sort of a de designer developer type of application. Um, the idea with this application is it's, it's kind of a executive level dashboard designed to, for a, uh, whoever's in charge of, of sales per se, for example, to uh, determine how much revenue they're anticipating for the next quarter. And so the way that that's done is they are thinking about opportunities, the size of those opportunities, how much revenue they represent, also the probability that one of those deals will come through. So as you'll see here as I, I move around uh, this particular opportunity, it's called the Malibu Project, it's supposed to bring in 700,000. I actually don't think that's gonna be, happen. I'm gonna reduce the probability. You can see the probability is changing here at, on the tooltip. And uh, the projected revenue up here is also declining as well. So when uh, maybe the chief financial officer or the head of sales has to give an accurate estimate to, to uh, uh, shareholders or, or for uh, the accounting purposes, they have a more accurate number. So moving ahead here, there's different views. This is really designed just to show kind of an executive style dashboard in a way, and maybe a bit like the Google Analytics um, application. So a listing of accounts, this is all sample data. Um, I can drill down into a particular account, get additional information. It's very rich UI. Maybe I want to see exactly the relationships between different executives and who my contacts are in case I need to call them and kind of push them a little bit, make that probability go up on that the, the deal is going to happen this quarter. Um, it's a really nice application. And uh, again, it's, this particular app is built in Flex primarily. has really nice search capabilities too. So if I type in... Adobe, for example, here, you see that it kind of has spotlight style search capabilities, which, which I kind of, I really like. Oops. So uh, I'll close out this application. Show another media player. This is one that Adobe is working on and also available for download on our website. Um, it's a little different than uh, the previous application in that this is really about providing a way for you to personalize what, what you want to watch. And the way that's done is that different broadcasters will provide RSS feeds that describe not only the content uh, and the video clips that they, that are, that they want to share, but also branding information about how they want this particular player to look. So it's customized to, the, to, uh, to, to reflect their brand. As an example of that, I'll, I'll move into a show. It's very subtle here. Uh, PBS decided in this particular case that they, oh, in fact, I don't even know that you can see it. Let me find a better one here. But there's a slight PBS logo in the background. Let's find one that's a little bit more obvious. Uh, let's try this. So here, I think you can see a little bit better. But you can see, for example, there's a, a logo up here. There's kind of this um, faded out, transparent um, image in the background that they've decided to customize. Um, broadcasters obviously like this because they can kind of instill more of their brand into the user experience. But they also don't necessarily have to worry about all the, uh, the maintenance of the player itself, which is very time consuming. So if I go in, I'll move back to the Wired show because I enjoy this one. So you can see here that the, here's the video um, as you would expect. Again, it's not showing H.264 video. That's something that will be coming soon. So if the video quality looks a little um, it's actually not too bad here. It looks reasonably well. Um, these files can be downloaded to the local machine. It's really up to whoever is sharing the files to decide on how they want to distribute their, their content. One of the other things that's nice about this particular app is I, they've done a nice job, even though it's, it, it can be kind of difficult to navigate through an app where there's different levels of, of content. Um, different sections, but they're using this nice sort of breadcrumb UI up here, so I always know where I am. I can move back. The subtle effects that you saw, the way the UI is kind of shifting around, um, kind of indicate where, I at, where I'm at. Am I moving forward in the experience or am I moving backwards? Um, our XD team at Adobe spent a lot of time working on this application, and uh, it's actually getting better and better. This is a slightly older, older build. Uh, let's see. So one that I, that I also like here, it's called uh, AirTalker. It's a very 
I don't know if you've seen this one, Ed, actually. This might be kind of interesting. But this was built by one person uh, who lives in, I believe it's Singapore. He's like in his early 20s. He loves, just a, loves Flash. Um, looked at air. We had a, a contest to basically uh, get as many people to build as many interesting applications as possible for our last beta. And so this is what something that he submitted. I've already configured my account here, but if, if anybody's used something like Mebo before where you can log into uh, a single site and basically have multiple, you know, you can connect into your Yahoo, your Google, your, uh, you know, what, whatever uh, system that you like. And so that's basically what he's built here. Um, so I can see now that I have some friends online. Um, and uh, so I can see who's offline. They've, he's also integrated with um, Flickr, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so if right now I could type in a search. Maybe I wanted to look at Adobe Air. So here I can see some, in fact, pretty cool. Our new logo's already showing up. That's interesting. We just released this logo a few days ago. So um, I click on it. I'm getting a nice preview of that image. Maybe I want to save it locally, view it in the browser. I don't know why I'd want to do that. But um, I can close it down. Uh, but it shows nice integration, not only with instant messaging technology, technologies, but also data services with storage of images. And then also, of course, I can see the, the images that I've taken because uh, I, log, I logged in and authenticated and gave it permission to display the images. So here's a trip that I took earlier in the year to Finland when it was extremely cold, but a uh, very beautiful city. Um, so again, this is just what one person built in a very short period of time. Uh, and they're, uh, they have their own website for it. You can download it. I, I believe it's just airtalker.com. Also, in incidentally, that Google Analytics application was also built by an individual as well. So it's pretty, we're pretty amazed at what people are pulling off right now with um, you know, not large teams. Another application that's, that's pretty, pretty original and probably one of the more clever applications we've seen, it's called Snippage. And uh, basically what it allows you to do is uh, create your own little widgets based off of existing web pages. So show an example here. Maybe I want to go to grab the latest, uh, I don't know, Let me click here. Expands out to a browser. Maybe I want to go to well, uh, cnn.com. You can see when I load the web page, it has this little uh, frame here, and I can move it around. It's rendered the web page in the background. I'm gonna. I always want to know what the latest news is on CNN. And sure, I could subscribe to an RSS feed, but I just I just like seeing the headlines. I want to be able to click on it, have it launch into a browser. So I define the area. I go ahead and I create my widget, and there you have it. So now it's always there. It'll update. Um, I can I can tell at the interval that I want it to refresh. So maybe every 10 minutes, maybe it's you know every hour. It's really up to me to customize. Rob, is that sort of UI that's dancing around? Is that Flash or Flex based? Or this app is uh, I'm 99% sure it's Flash, but I haven't spoken to but, the developer. I mean, obviously, there's substantial use of HTML, but then there's also some of that Chrome is being done in Flash. Yeah. So uh, again, that was just one developer working on that. Since we've still got a fair amount of time, I, I, we could open it up for some questions, or I can keep showing additional demos if people if people are interested. Are there questions? Maybe we can take a, ask a few. Go ahead. Um, Flash has ninety percent of the browsers installed in the world sewn up as for plugins. With this Air stuff, are you going to be starting from scratch again with the install base? Ah, oh, great question. So. Uh, one thing that Adobe and, and uh, Macromedia, which of course no longer exists and it used to, to run and operate the Flash Player, excel at are distribution of, of uh, software. So PDF is also um, heavily penetrated. Um, there are something on the order of 300 million PDFs out on the web. Um, Flash Player, it takes about nine, nine to 10 months now to do a full uh, upgrade of 98% of the uh, population to a new version of the, of the player. So we're looking at different ways. We, we, we tend to think that content, really great killer applications, are going to drive adoption. 
And we haven't shown the, the experience. Uh, maybe I should take a quick second and just kind of show uh, what the experience would look like for installing a new application. I have the runtime already installed, so you won't be able to see that. See if you can find that HTML Twitter app. You know the one I mean, right? Uh, uh, yeah, what's it called? Um, Twitter HTML. Yes, fast. Actually, I think it's just a story about him. Let me. So we're looking for uh, another app that's a pure HTML app. This, in this case, a Twitter client. It was a, a, a fellow out in the development community did, and we'll show the install experience using that. Hopefully, he's got it set up to do it. Under projects. OK, yeah, this is a great example. You want to talk through this one? Ed? Sure. So um, you know, a bunch of stuff about his page, but the um, install badge here, the clickable UI here, is what's going to kick off the whole experience. So if Rob will go ahead and click that. Uh, this is install experience that's saying, hey, do you want to save this, you know, essentially installer, or do you want to run it? We're going to run it. This, this, all this UI is being provided by the Air Runtime. Uh, now it's saying, hey, uh, in this case, he's not used the code signing to sign his app. If he had, it would be able to identify him using his cert that he got from VeriSign or Thought or wherever. He hasn't, but we know him, so we will go ahead and install it. It's fine. Now it's installed as an application. And in this case, Rob set it to run right after. Uh, if we were to go look in the applications folder on Mac, you'd see this app was now there, has its own icon. Again, all that stuff is up to Air to take care of. You provide the icon and say, hey, make this my app's icon. And when that gets installed on Windows, we make it the right sort of icon for Windows. When it gets installed on Mac, we make it the right kind of icon for Mac. So there's a bunch of stuff like that going on to make these things work properly. And now here we have an app. This app is totally HTML. It would look the exact, it would look exactly the same on Mac and Windows, and uh, it is a Twitter client. And that was the whole install experience. So we just went through it. Now, if he had, he already has the Air runtime. If he hadn't had it, the install experience would have almost been identical. The um, there would have been one extra little dialogue in there, and then during the install sequence, it would have told you, by the way, we're installing the Air runtime with the application. Because you're, you're building this into the install experience is kicked off by Flash, yes. So Flash upgrade is, is Air enabled? Uh, no, so we, we won't push out Air as a sort of mandatory upgrade to the Flash player. You know, it, it's, it's on demand. The first time you hit an Air-based application, you'll go through that sequ some sequence very much like we just saw, but which will get the application as well as the, the particular application as well as the Air runtime all together in a sort of a very seamless experience. The question is, how big is the Air runtime? Uh, it's 9 megs right now on Windows. I think the Mac size is similar. Please. Are there particular types or uh, types of applications, web apps, or features of web apps that really lend themselves to this? And maybe conversely, are there things about web apps that, that don't lend themselves to this? So uh, you know, there's a variety of reasons to want to do this and jump in when you've yep, got sure. thoughts, Rob. But you know, so, something, a common thread you've seen is sort of a desire for persistence. Like, I'm going to use my Twitter client all the time, or I'm going to use my IM client all the time, or I'm going to have my media player or my audio radio station thing all the time. You know, in those cases where it's an app you use and interact with all the time, fundamentally, I don't think the web browser is the best way to do it. You've, you have now have extra Chrome whose purpose is to let you surf around for a persistent experience. Turn it around um, for certain applications and certain usages that are more transient. It makes no sense to do this, right? I, I uh, you know, let's say there's a site that I use once a week, once a month, whatever it might be. I don't want a persistent experience for that. I want to go use it briefly, use it, hit the back button or type in a different URL and be done with it. So definitely part of it is just sort of what the engagement model is with the user, how often you're going to use it, how long you're going to use it, 
whether it kind of needs to be its own thing, whether you want it to have its own icon in the dock or on the Windows taskbar and really feel like its own thing or not. From, and that's from a user standpoint. Certainly from a developer standpoint, um, if you want your brand to sort of be front and center and if you want users to be interacting with your application or your content all the time, you know, you can see the appeal for, for having an application like this. Of course, um, you know, there's a variety of capabilities that you can get at because of the security model being a desktop app security model, the persistence, the popping notifications, the reading and writing local files and so forth that you wouldn't want to offer in a browser model because the security contract is different. If I surf to Google or I surf to eBay, I've not given you permission to mess around with my local machine. But if I go and install an application and it said, hey, we're installing an application, look, it's from eBay, or, you know, are you willing to give it these powers? And I say yes, then I've opted into having you know, a tighter relationship with what they're doing. So if all your HTML is on a server, it's pretty easy to roll a new version. If it's on the client, you have to somehow update. Does Air have a mechanism to allow apps to self-update? Yeah, and in, in fact, uh, when Rob ran the AOL app, it asked him if it wanted, he wanted to update it, and he said no. But um, say yes, Rob. Let's see what happens. Actually, there's a, there's a bug with their particular app. All right, right don't now. say yes. There's a bug. <laughs> it keeps asking you, I believe. Um, yeah, so yeah. Um, it's very easy for an application to essentially check to see if there's an update available and then kick the runtime to say, there's a new version of me. Take care of this up, update. Um, we've built low-level support in. And we're also building framework level support. So what I mean by that is at the low level, you get a very raw API that says, this is the new installer, make it so. And Air takes care of the sequence of doing the upgrade and restarting the app and all that sort of thing. The higher level will be build framework to help you detect, hey, is there a new version available? We'll go out, ping some website or something. But it's not required. So as, as a developer, you can do whatever you want. So you could you know, make some app where somebody has to type in their credit card number to get the new version. or you know, it polls only on alternate Tuesdays to see when it launches to see if, you know, it doesn't matter to us. If somebody can write that and at the end of the day, just tell us, here's the update, go do it. So you'll be able to use sort of an out of the box thing that's got limited customizability or just write it yourself and then use our low level API. So you demonstrated some clear benefits to building an air app versus a pure web app. Um, I have a similar question now, which is, it, when, if you're building a desktop app, what are the key reasons that people use this uh, versus just building a native app? Is it ease of development or are there other reasons too? Yeah, obviously it depends on the application that you're trying to, to, to build. I mean, if you're trying to build a, a, uh, you know, a full on word processor, it can be done. Um, we have an example of, of that. Uh, it's, it requires a significant amount of time, but if you're building something rel relatively uh, straightforward that's taking advantage of services, um, that has data visualization, that's doing lots of video, it's really rich. Um, we think that you could do that much quicker than you could if you're coding, say, in C++ or some other, other language. So um, what's interesting is that with Air, again, web developers are starting to get more interested in building desktop applications. So a lot of the, first thing, the things that we're seeing so far feel a little kind of web-like, but they are doing some desktop stuff. In the long run, we anticipate they'll be richer and more uh, sophisticated applications one thing, um, for example, that we've seen, which uh, was quite impressive, is something called uh, Digimix, is a application that is basically a full-on mixing, Digimix, a full-on audio mixer built uh, in, in air, and you can dry, drop out, you know, files. You can do mixes. Uh, you can save them out as WAV files. Um, so I won't, I won't demo this application, but you kind of get the idea. It, you could do very typical desktop type applications in Air. I mean, I, but there, there could be exceptions. I, you know, it depends on your use, what you're particularly trying to build. Yeah, I, let me just add to that a little bit. Partially it depends on your skill set. So if you're already well versed in the web technologies, then going and say, hey, go learn.net or, or C++ or whatever, pretty steep learning curve. Um, second, cross-platform. So you know, developing some of these media players and so forth cross-platform is something I've done before in C++, and it's no fun at all. Developing using things like Flex and Flash and HTML takes care, you know, for certain things, a lot of things become a whole lot easier just because you're building on what's already there, and you're able to do it cross-platform. There's also the code reuse aspect of if you want to use a lot of the same code in the browser and not in the browser, 
It's a way of doing it. I, I guess I'm thinking from the perspective of a company that like, like Google, for example, that cares about performance probably above almost anything else. And it's like, I can see how I could build something with Air that might take a month, that might take a year otherwise or something. But the question is, is that worth it for you know the performance overhead and requiring the users to install a runtime and, and things like that? Yeah, so it'll depend. Regarding the requiring the users to install the runtime, obviously, you know, Adobe will be working to get the runtime deployed to everybody. And as more apps drive it, you know, that cost will get amortized across apps. As far as performance, it really depends what you're doing. Like if you're looking for video playback, for example, we're going to be doing really, really good video playback H.264. You know, our, our code is all C++ and optimized like crazy and hardware accelerated and so forth. Um, if you're talking about raw, like I'm going to sit in a loop and, and crunch some numbers, even the jitted code is not going to be as fast as what I could write in C++ or assembly if I, at the end of the day. Now, we're going to keep investing in the virtual machine technology and make it faster and faster, but you'll always be able to posit a case where you could go faster to the metal. And it just depends on how much you need and what you need to do. Yeah, um, this is kind of related to my previous question. But going back to that application, Digimix, that you just showed off, um, I'm a little confused. So I understand some of the benefits that Air is providing in terms of, like you said, tighter uh, integration with the native look and feel. And also, you don't need to have this browser running all the time. And um, but I'm I'm curious about the extent of the APIs you guys are providing that are not available inside the browser. Um, so I guess my question with Digimix is, if let's say I had a browser where I said I'm going to allow my browser application to access files on disk, um, what I guess my question is, what is Digimix doing that a browser could not do, apart from accessing native? I mean, is it do is it taking advantage of? Uh, Processing power on the client that is not available in the browser? Is it because it's, is it taking, I mean, sure, you might have a faster JIT enabled VM um, that's not available on the browser right now. But, or, so, for example, let's say I built a, uh, some sort of Twitter client like you showed. Um, would you have any network API that let me control or let me find out information about my particular client, like how fast it's going or how busy the network is? That's, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, apart from the look and feel, what is Air giving me that's not available in a browser in terms of like native integration? So it's certainly the case that certain applications and certain feature sets of applications you could absolutely run both in the browser and in Air. And we're not here to pitch desktop, 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 don't use the browser. I don't care. Like if it's the right thing to use in the desktop, make it desktop. If it's not, don't. I mean, from our perspective, you know, we're trying to extend the web platform out of the browser into the desktop where it makes sense. Our technologies and our goals work both in the browser and outside the browser. So if something works best in the browser, keep it in the browser. There are So Digimix, for example, probably largely could work in the browser. Um, I haven't deep dived this particular app. I would guess that some of the drag and drop capabilities for dumping in and out mixes are probably more difficult in the browser reading and writing the WAV files and MP3s off of the disk, um, sort of opening up the whole UI from a Chrome standpoint. Um, but yeah, fundamentally, I think most of this app, in fact, this uh, app is probably Flex. I'm not sure. Um, but the, uh, the jitted virtual machine is avail available in the Flash Player in the browser. So our goal, at, for, for example, is not to have Air apps have higher performance than desktop apps, sorry, than, than browser-based apps unless there's something special about the desktop or the security model that lets us do that. What, one feature, by the way, I don't think we talked to, about too much, but just so you know, uh, there, will, there will be a capability to launch an Air application from within a browser. So you could basically say, oh, well, now that I have that Google Analytics application installed, um, Maybe users, I don't think users are ever going to find it in, the, in their program files folder. They're just never going to touch it again. Well, you could, you could stick a button on your website and say launch. And so that might be a different way to interact with the desktop application. You touched on this a little bit, but uh, what do you guys think of Gears? Gears is cool. We've uh, had some discussions with the Gears team. Um, and cause, yeah, obviously, we were both using SQLite and both putting in uh, uh, you know, offline capabilities. Um, so, you know, in air, 
you have the same database as you have in Gears, and uh, we've had some discussions about putting in some adapter layers so that the same sort of HTML code could be used both in AIR and in Gears. And we've had some initial discussions with the Gears team about that sort of thing. And in fact, the, the community has already started to write uh, those those data layers. Uh, this application that I actually I don't yeah I showed you this one very briefly, but this. Uh, Oh, yeah. oh, no, I didn't show you this didn't one. show this. It's another HTML, pure HTML app, this one. This particular app, the, the author of it, um, basically create a layer so that you can write out either to Gears or you can write out to an error. And, and it's just a matter of what, whatever you want to do. <laughs> so that's, we think that's a great way to, to integrate with Gears, and uh, we anticipate we'll see more innovation like that. But we're excited because, obviously, working on the same code base just makes everything stronger. So more minds working on harder on problems together. So uh, looks like we're out of time. We're, we're, uh, we appreciate you all for uh, coming here. And we'll be around after. Uh, so if you have questions, um, and if anyone's interested, we wanna, uh, if you want to join our pre-release program, please come see us, because we'd certainly love to have, uh, have you join it, um, provide feedback. Uh, we can help answer questions. We've been working with a lot of these customers. So if there's a particular scenario, you're, you're curious about, would this be a good application for AIR? Let us know. Uh, we can give you our contact information as well. So thank you, everyone. Thanks.